Elon Musk continues to alienate advertisers while also launching the Cybertruck. Also, Meta's Instagram has an algorithm problem and has artificial intelligence taken a hit with the whole Sam Altman open AI drama over the past few weeks. We're going to talk about those stories and more on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me to discuss recent technology news is Jeremy Duvall. He is a contributor to InfoWorld and founder of Seven Factor Software. We also have Chris, the guy behind the monitors. Hello, guys. Hey, how's it going? Jeremy, did you have a good Thanksgiving? Everything was was, was good holiday-wise? I did. I did two Thanksgivings, and for some reason, I think fried chicken was a thing because I did fried chicken, but then I read like a bunch of articles that you should do fried chicken, so I don't know. I wonder if that's a Southern thing. It must be. Yeah, yeah. I'm south, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Fried chicken is everywhere down here. Uh, actually, my, my kids don't like turkey, so I got, some, I got them some Chick-fil-A the day before, and then we reheated that for them. Nice. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's just jump right into the the, the hot news story of, of the day is is this whole stuff going on with Elon Musk. Uh, apparently, he told uh, advertisers to go f themselves. Uh, that's always a fun thing to do if you want to destroy a company. Um, he was at the uh, New York Times Deal Book Summit on on you know, this past Wednesday, and uh, he's he's been dealing with. The grappling, the departure of several large advertisers in the wake of a post where he described uh, an anti Semitic post as the actual truth, which elicited a new round of criticism that he promotes anti Semitic views. Uh, it, it, and basically, during this discussion, he basically said that he didn't want to be threatened by um, advertisers or, or extorted or blackmail, was that? Blackmail. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, is. <laughs> I'm getting kind of a little tired of all this Elon Musk stuff of, of you know, we have to cover everything. And of course, we, we're going to talk about the Cybertruck, too, uh, which apparently launched as well. And uh, people got a, a first look at some of, well, not a first look, but, you know, more looks at this this weird truck. Um, so let, let's talk about, do you think that Elon Musk is just trying to destroy Twitter slash X with, with all of this stuff? Or is he just trolling everybody or is he just like to being the center of attention? I, I'm going to throw it to you guys. Cause I think I, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of it. All of the above. I think, <laughs> um, do you expect anything less from this guy at this point? I mean, I, I have a hard time. Like, obviously he's done something to get to the position he's at, right? We can't deny the fact that he is the richest person on the planet. Again, if that's your bar for success, cool. Um, but at the same time, how you interact with other people is is more important to me. Um, so I, I, I don't think that he cares. I legitimately think that he's at the top of the food chain and he bought Twitter as a toy for him to play with and decided, you know what, forget it. I don't even care anymore. Yeah, Chris, you got you get you wanted to be the straw man in this one, right? Or you, yeah, you, I mean, every, everybody's going to have their own opinion on it, and everybody is entitled to their own opinion. That that's only fair. But I, I I don't know. The way I see it is, I mean, good for him, good good for him. You know, um, if someone is actually going to try to blackmail him, uh, I think the typical approach would be to say nothing and to just go along with it. But yeah. you know, I think he he's just. He's just sticking it to the man, you know. Well, he's just, he's just gonna say what he's gonna say. And I, in that, in that um, video, the video where he, where he says, you know, go f yourself. Yeah. At the very end of it, he basically said, like, you know, l let's leave it to the public to decide, or he said, l leave it to the public to be the judge, something like that. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that's fair enough. All right, well, l we'll let the public decide. So well, that's very fair. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the, you know. The way that Twitter operates or X is, is is operating is that in order to make some money, you need the support of advertisers. And um, in, in one of the stories I was reading, he says, you know, if advertisers don't return, Musk said, quote, what this advertising boycott is going to do, it's going to kill the company. He seemed almost resigned to the possibility, speaking as speaking of it almost as though X were a martyr and advertisers were the enemy. That is what everybody on earth will know. We'll be gone and it'll be gone because of an advertiser boycott. Couldn't, if, if you don't, if you don't get money from advertisers, you then have to get money from subscribers. Right. 
in, in theory. So, right. you know, there is a movement where if you don't want advertisers, you set up a Patreon or you do kind of like subscriptions and, and, and run it that way. Now, is Twitter X too big to try to go this subscriber route? They did they did have a paid, you know, you got that blue check mark thing for eight bucks a month or whatever it is. Um, maybe he's just maybe he's just looking to, to move the company that way or he just want or he doesn't care. <laughs> like Again, I, I, I think, no, I go think ahead. social media is social media companies from a business model perspective are fundamentally different, right? What if Facebook came to you and said, okay, now we're going to charge you $5 a month or right. a dollar a month to use Facebook. What would your response be? Probably go F yourself <laughs> to be frank, because the whole idea that Twitter evolved into this. So it started as a way to provide very short, brief pieces of information like SMS out in the ether that's like a timeline and and it was a, a really interesting i remember when it i remember first interacting with twitter when when i was in college right um and it was a, a good idea to provide bite-sized pieces of information in a world where it was very much geared towards information overload like let's it was a challenge for example to come up with a tweet that made sense that was short enough um and then the news um and and media saw this as a huge opportunity to to be able to real time tweet the news right which was different than the way they used to do it back with papers you would publish things and it would go out the next news cycle right you know we live in a 24 hour news cycle now so i, I think that Twitter evolved into that platform, but but from Musk's perspective, I think he saw it as something different. I think he saw it as a free speech platform, which, okay, cool. I, I like free speech. That's why I live in America. But you have to recognize that that, that has to be propped up financially by someone. And the uh, logical choice, the choice that Google made back in the day and made them a multi-billion dollar company is advertising. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and Facebook did the same to, to a similar extent, Facebook did it with advertising, but they also did it with data capture yeah. and try to get all this information uh, that we know about you because you've given this up because we've given you this for free. Uh, and then they sell that information to advertisers. So that's why in general, when I get an ad tailored to me, it's for, uh, you know, a white male plus 50 and, and, you know, suburban and you know i get all these things you get the home depot ads <laughs> i get a home Ace hardware right. yeah golf ads things that i'm not really interested in but like they're close but they're not perfect um but the more and more the more you use it the more the algorithm knows and and then it starts spying on you uh with this microphone and so if i mention mention weird shoes all of a sudden weird shoe ads come up on my my facebook feed um, it, it's, it's not like there's an, the other alternative would be to pay. And, and I think some people like Facebook enough where they would pay if, if the dollar amount was, was low enough. Cause we are, you know, there's right. a lot of other things that people subscribe to as well. Streaming services are doing this, but streaming services where they set a bar for like, okay, you can get no ads for 15 bucks a month. And as we've seen from Disney plus, they can't sustain that model with just subscriptions. And so they, right. so they either raise the price higher, which then drives all of these people going, Oh, you know, F you and, and, and I'll cancel. But then they were like, well, how about this? You know, here's the $7 or the $6 per month plan. And yeah, we're going to just throw some ads in it. You know, you're going to get maybe a minute or two of ads and then they'll slowly build that up and up and up because they can make more money selling more advertisements. And so it's, yep. it, it almost seems cyclical here, but I, I still don't know exactly what Elon Musk is doing. Like, what does he want? Does he want subscribers? Does he want like paid subscribers? Does he want advertisers? I can't tell what he wants. I don't and, think he cares. I really don't. <laughs> or he's just crazy. <laughs> it, I, it's a great point where you bring up the, that he sees the platform differently than I think other people may have seen the platform before. Well, the other thing we have to think about too is like when when he did um, buy it out, he kind of opened the door to the back room to kind of show how the sausage is made yep. a little bit, I yeah. think. Like yep. kind of exposing, you know, what percentage of active users are actual bots and stuff like that. And while, yeah, it's, it's true to have, you know, our social media platforms are free and they're basically run by advertisers, but... I, I think that kind of increased the prevalence of bots. You know, if it, any bot, you know, you can kind of create all these free accounts. And it, when you do that to a social media platform, it just gives this kind of inaccurate representation of, you know, an audience, right? 
right? If so let's say a majority of them are bots, it's not really authentic anymore. You know what I mean? It's hard yeah. to disseminate, you know, what's actually real and what's actually, you know, fabricated from some sort of algorithm, right? So I think there might be, yeah, that, uh, that might be, I think that was a small part of also, you know, like what he did with Twitter, you know, on, on top of everything else that he, he tried to do with it. Yeah. I mean, there is no such thing as free lunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> let's continue to talk about Elon Musk. Uh, so also apparently the Cybertruck was uh, released, launched. Um, I just I, I like this story just because you can see some pictures about the of of the Cybertruck. Um, again, I'm not a I'm not a fan of of Tesla. I've never been inside a regular Tesla. Um, I'm I'm not a big proponent right now of EV based on the infrastructure demands that it places on consumers to try to get one of these things. I mean, it's recharge. cool. I mean, look what, at does, it. You know, really, yeah. that that's what cool is defined as. Yeah, that's it's what, like something straight out of cool, like N N sixty four graphics. You know, very uh, <laughs> po polygonal. Uh. It looks like a, a car designed for an Atari cartridge. <laughs> I mean, look, it's it's a novelty item, right? You, you, like if you have the money for it, if you have access to like all the EV stuff, whatever, yeah, sure, you're gonna buy it. But it's not a practical. Yeah, Jeremy, are you thing. lined up to buy one of these? You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> no, jump. No, absolutely not. <laughs> um, I mean, so the Ford. If you y'all remember, I think Ford tried to come out with a Ford Lightning EV. I don't remember the fate of that particular vehicle, but that thing looked amazing. This looks terrible. Oh, you, you mean the Ford, the, the 150 on Lightning? The yeah, the 150 yeah, the, the F-150 Lightning. There was an EV version of that that looked sick, and I was very excited about that. But this thing, there's no way I would ever buy that. Yeah. Like, yeah. you guys, like, so so are you, are you a truck guy, Jeremy? No, like, I, I mean, sort of. I grew up in a rural area, so so trucks were a thing that were, you used them to work. You didn't really use them to to look cool, but I think they've sort of transitioned more towards that these days. Yeah, I mean, yeah, up here in New England, I think it, there are there are a lot of people that use trucks to get work done and, and do work, but there are a lot of 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 knowledge workers who have a truck, <laughs> and and they do like to show it off a little bit. I I just don't understand. I I, I again I, I'm outside of that universe and don't understand it. Trucks today, especially full size pickup trucks, are way overpriced way overpriced and a lot of them are leaning towards like these luxury features and stuff i think it was one of the f i think it was either ford or dodge i'm pretty sure it was ford but how they integrate i mean it's cool but like they integrated like a desk in the middle of the <laughs> car like you fold open yeah. the center console it creates a desk because of course if you're buying that car you're gonna have to take your laptop and do some work on it or whatever but it's like maybe not well there's not a lot really, of listen but, if you're a contractor or if you're someone that works out in the field and it's a nice it's a nice feature to have if you need to then you know get on a computer and do some some okay um, sure calculations but not for 70 to eighty thousand dollars like <laughs> for a, a truck like that like when i bought my tacoma uh it's a 2015 tacoma it's gonna last me forever i don't need to worry about it it was for twenty five thousand. i thought that was a lot yeah when i bought it because i'm like this is just a truck like there's there's nothing really under it like it's just it's just an old school style truck twenty five thousand. Like and I and I thought that was a lot. There's no way, especially now looking at the Cybertruck. Okay, what, what is it? Not only that. Oh, we don't even we don't even know what the official yeah. price is. Not we only not only that, but a lot of people need to think about the weight as well. Yeah. Like these things are going to yeah. weigh a ton. And actually, believe it or not, I think it's the it was the EV Hummer <laughs> GM release that it literally cannot go down roads. Not meant for uh, uh, those eighteen wheelers because yeah. of the weight. It, um, it weighs so much, and it's like now, okay, now take that off road or use it for work. So if if the truck already weighs X amount, and then you're gonna haul something with it, oh my god! Well, remember where when, can you drive that? Yeah, remember when the Hummers came out and it was like you could get ten? What was it? Ten miles to the gallon. Or, yeah. or, or something like that low, the MPG, and, and you, or you would have to basically, you know, fill it up for 200 bucks to, to do anything. Like, those went away pretty quickly as gas prices went up. Um, right. You know, the big thing on this one is I've, I've seen rumors about what the range is for this, and I think people are saying it's about 270 miles, which um, doesn't seem to be that many. I mean, 
Yeah, I, I saw somewhere as they um, like I that's going to be the big reveal too at some point about how, how you know yeah. how little this can go uh, before you have to recharge it. Uh, maybe I can find it, but I, I think a journalist was able to take a quick photo of the center console, and on the center console it had the battery indicator, and it gave a a duration of time of how much time was left, and I think it was only like a quarter. Sorry, it was three quarters full, and it said something like hour and a half remaining or something like that yeah i I gotta find it don't take that with a grain of salt but um and then and then the stain there's a stainless steel body which apparently can repel joe rogan's uh arrow uh (laughs) but there aren't there other problems with stain again this is beyond my pay grade or interest uh Stainless steel body frame it's very means heavy. bad things or good it's things. Very it's very heavy. Yeah. yeah. Stainless yeah. steel is just an alloy, right? But it's super, super heavy. And again, going back to the range thing, I just wanted to jump in. Yeah. In order to get that range, you have to have an incredibly large battery. And something I think people don't spend enough time talking about is the impacts of creating those batteries and how much that, um, both from an economics perspective and, and also just from, from, uh, the waste produced from building those things um, like that, that to me is another big turnoff. And, and again, I'm not against EVs. I think they have their place, but in general, we're adding another uh, giant battery consuming vehicle to the fleet of already giant battery consuming vehicles. And I mean, that, that seems to be a bad idea to me. Yeah. And Chris, weren't you telling me the, the other day you were concerned about if this thing gets in a crash, um, oh yeah! If, if know, this most, thing most, gets in most a cars crash, are designed to crumple. I you're guess, gonna now. Get, it's, <laughs> it's gonna be like getting wall. it's gonna be like getting hit with a tank. <laughs> like you're you're dead. Yeah, you're, you're dead. So, so it's gotta you, have. So if you see one on these roads, basically back off or get out of the way. Yeah, because you know the sharp edges, it's gonna like slice your car in half. Right. Right. Well, the or, cars, it's gonna, or it's gonna be like Mad Max, where they're gonna have spikes yeah. on the wheels, and then you're gonna you know as as we're all fighting for gasoline right. in the post apocalyptic future. Um, yeah, I'll take the Cybertruck if we ever get to that point. Yeah. So um, <laughs> just real quick, cars today they're designed to have crumple zones, right in the front, in the right. rear. And stuff like from that. A so, from a safety perspective, right? Safety perspective, right? Because it takes all of the energy from the crash away from the human driving. Right. It kind of dissipates the impact because it crumples, it folds under the pressure, right? So if you're making a car so rigid and and strong like that, like you, I wouldn't want to be in the front of of that truck. And we That's don't even gonna, have, have they done any crash tests on on this? At I don't all? think they're ready yet to do i don't think they can i don't think they can do crash tests i mean elon can try it out but uh (laughs) well there is a there is a youtube video out there called cyber truck crash testing results revealed i'm not sure i haven't watched it but you know there there are a bunch of videos out there i mean maybe we're totally wrong maybe it's the safest truck out there (laughs) (laughs) it could be the safest it could be totally safe uh, uh, there's another know. article on InsideEVs.com. Here's how the Cy- Tesla Cybertruck holds up in a crash test. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll have to look that up. Yeah, there are comparisons that I've seen because of the stainless steel body to the DeLorean uh, from you know the 80s, and of course that got turned into uh, the DeLorean is now associated with Back to the Future. Uh, maybe we'll see a Back to the Future reboot in a in a you know few years, and they'll use a Cybertruck as the the vehicle, um, and maybe that'll become its legacy. But do you think? I mean, it, these things aren't. Is this going to move the needle on either the EV space, the EV truck space, or is it just is it just kind of like Musk's folly type of a thing? Uh, I, I think it's going to make people re reevaluate their desire to have an EV, I think. Um, I mean, if we look at Ford's F-150 Lightning sales, the, the, they're the not good. Down. Yeah. No, they're, they're horrible. Yeah, they're not. So, uh, and, like, and it's not necessarily because of the truck itself, but isn't it because of the concerns about how long it takes to recharge or well, where to find a recharging and that, or is there something wrong with the truck? I, I think it might actually be a concern of the truck itself because, okay. again, the people that are looking for a truck, I don't think you're going to buy an EV truck. Now, if you're, exactly. if you, you know, live in a small community and you just go, you know, in and out of town and you also have a, a gasoline engine, you're, you're going to buy those smaller EVs, right? They're a little bit more affordable and you have a use case for it, right? So I think buying these kind of 
again, novelty EVs, I think people are going to reevaluate that, except for, for some reason, the Rivian, the R1 <laughs> Rivian. I see those everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Everywhere. That, yeah. It, it's, it's mind boggling. But there's something about that. That EV truck is uh, interesting. Yeah. And, and we're also now in the uh, early December in the uh, Northeast. Um, this might not be a big a deal for you down in, uh, Georgia, Jeremy, is that, um, things tend to get cold in the winter, December, January, February, we, we get cold weather and there are going to be parts of the country that are even colder than where we are in new England. Um, and I think this will be the first season where we're going to see a lot of stories about, uh, either the battery freezing up or somehow your, uh, battery, which was giving you, you know, 400, 500 miles is now going to go down to that 200 mile level. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more stories around that as well. And again, maybe a giant battery in the cyber truck will belay that or slow it down. But yeah, we're going to start seeing stories around that too. Jeremy, get any other thoughts on the cyber truck before we move on? I grew up in a small town uh, where we had trucks see them everywhere. And I think you hit it on the head in that you're, your user base for trucks are not the kinds of humans that are normally going to purchase an electric vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, you're looking at people in the Midwest, you're looking at people in Texas and the Southeast. And it's just, I think that's one of the reasons you see these things doing poorly. Um, the F-150 was like one of the legendary trucks, right? When, when I grew up in North Georgia and that's what everybody wanted back in the day that and the Chevy Silverado, and, um, you know, these days I'm still friends with people in that area and they're like, there ain't no way I'm buying something that's electric. So I think maybe one day we'll see this be an, a thing, but, but right now it's the time is not, not now for yeah. people to start yeah. buying these electric trucks. I don't think anyway. Do you think if one of these trucks, um, started driving through uh, a small town in, in either Georgia or Texas or somewhere in, in the South that, um, a bunch of people would then just take out their shotguns and start trying to shoot it, um, which so is a good thing that, that is that bulletproof. Right? <laughs> That's we're a not stick. that bad, I promise. Uh, <laughs> I think people would point and and probably say, "The hell is that?" Um, but no, no, I don't. I don't think it's well. I mean, if it's if it's the Tesla truck, it's like a freaking armored tank. So who cares? Just right, shoot right, it, right. Well, yeah, up in New England, it wouldn't be shotguns. It would be just everyone will throw their Dunkin' Donuts cup with <laughs> at, at the uh, sticks and torches, right? Pitchfork. That's accurate. That's that's probably yeah, exactly. Throw my that. dunks at it. Uh, all right, let's um, let's let's go on. I, I, this is now th this story. This is uh, the Amazon story that I want to talk about. Uh, oh no, or you want to go to OpenAI? Oh, we can go to OpenAI. All right, let's. Um, we were off last week uh, for Thanksgiving, so we did not get a chance to talk about all of the OpenAI. Sam Altman, uh, he's fired. He's not fired. He's back. Microsoft. There were so many different angles of of this story, and I'm sure that the other podcasts and other places that that we're publishing more more frequently than we do had a lot to talk talk about it. But what I want to do is I want to talk about kind of the aftermath and, and what did we learn from all of this drama? Even, even it's still going on. I think there was a story today about Microsoft now has a non observing role on the new board that was created through all this drama. Um, but um, Jeremy, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Like uh, where do you see a lot of companies um, evaluating this whole drama? Like, does this put a dent in the enthusiasm and support for open AI and chat GPT and some of those technologies, or is it just a blip on the radar? And, and like, it's, it's fascinating for media types to watch this and compare this to shows like succession or game of Thrones, uh, or, yeah. or are there some serious concerns that, that companies might have like from your this perspective is, as a company owner, what would you? Yeah, th say? this is a real world kind of game of Thrones political type move, um, which I have been fascinated by this. I've devoured these stories because it's one of the first times that we've seen some some interesting board drama related to a particular personality, right? Mm -hmm. Hashtag I'm completely trolling you. Um, <laughs> Steve Jobs back in the day had had a similar issue where he was kicked out of Apple and and got back in and so on and so forth. So I think we we all look at these things as just sort of feuds that are entertaining and it's sort of again Game of Thrones coming alive. Um, but from from a business perspective, um, I, I have less faith in the board, or, or I, at least the old board, because they 
pulled some interesting nonsense to to claim that Sam was not um, being candid, mm -hmm. right? How right. ambiguous of an accusation is that? You weren't being candid enough with us. What does that even mean? As someone who has participated and, and been under the subjectivity of boards before, I'm not always going to be completely candid with my board. I'm not going to lie to my board. I'm not going to tell them nonsense that's going to get me fired. But at the same time, you know, if there's a problem that I need to solve and I can solve it without their involvement, I mean, I would expect them to trust me to handle that as the lead of the company. And, and Sam has an interesting past, right? He grew up in a small sort of a, a, a well-to-do family, but they weren't like super rich. And he, his dad, I remember reading an article where he said his dad was always saying, help people like that's what you should do. And this is kind of what, you know, the, the, the board and also his chief scientists sort of threw back at him is that, you know, you're moving too fast. Uh, you're 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 going too quickly and you're not allowing humanity to 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 catch up to this idea of of artificial intelligence and how do we meter it and and I agree with that to a point for sure I, I think that perhaps we are moving a little bit too quickly um, because some legislation and, and other things have not caught up to the idea of artificial intelligence we've covered that on other shows yeah right? but I think that just watching this unfold makes me less confident in the board because the board just pulled some backhanded moves instead of, and, and this is my perspective, mm -hmm. instead of going to him and sitting him down and saying, let's have a conversation about what you're thinking, or maybe they did this and they're not telling us, but I'm assuming from the media coverage that they didn't do this uh, because they just got him on a call and said, by the way, you're fired. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's awesome. Thanks guys. Yeah. The company that I, you know, bled sweat and tears to build, you're just firing me. Okay. Amazing. And also there's some interesting stuff in how it's set up as a nonprofit and it's kind of designed to implode if they want to fire their investors. Like all of that is a totally different conversation, but all of these things that are, are it just makes the, the drama more interesting. Um, but it also certainly puts a lot of feathers in Satch's cap, Satch and Adela, right? Cause he rushed to say, Sam, come over here. Let's hire you. Let's put you on our sure, team. Sure. So he looks like a superhero now. Because he snapped him up and said, oh, let's let's bring this incredibly brilliant CEO and put him in charge of our own artificial intelligence sort of approach. And then a lot of the open AI people, including the Brutus, which was the uh, the <laughs> chief scientist, are saying, I want to work with Sam. And they threatened to quit and use that leverage to get the board to reinstate him. So it's just such an interesting drama. And it's just, it really is a, a conversation about human psychology. The companies are not just built by drones that are designed to make money the way that some boards and public entities want them to be. There is a whole dynamic of loyalty and there's a whole dynamic of this company was built by this person. So we're going to follow that guy and I don't really care about you guys and screw you and all this and that. So it's been a fascinating thing to watch. I, I love how you just compared this whole situation to Julius Caesar. Um <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, that's really good drama there. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was also fascinated by how much support Sam Altman got from his employees. Um, that showed a kind of loyalty that we that we generally don't see in companies. Uh, and so, and then I was also very surprised that that Altman just decided, well, you know, I guess I got the love of my employees. I'm going to go back. I want to go back. Um, it, you know, then there was this dynamic of, you know, the battle between the tech enthusiasts or the accelerationists, I've heard them being called, uh, versus the doomsayers, which would be the, you know, oh, go slow, go slow versus go fast, go fast. I, I'm starting to think that maybe this was one of the reasons that they paused the uh, new subscriptions for ChatGPT+. Plus. I still have not gotten uh, an okay yet to go and subscribe to this where, where I want to where I want to hand them my money. Uh, and so I have, you know, that's still on pause. Um, there are cynical people out there that, that would say, oh yeah, you know, money is still, money still won. Uh, there, you know, it's capitalism that, that that's the reason that, that they won. Um, take that with a grain of salt as well. But, um, I, I've learned more about nonprofit board structures than I ever wanted to learn <laughs> in the, sure. in this case. Um, and, and, you know, but then there were some reports about this Q star, uh, report or project where they're actually getting closer to non wait is it what is it general they're getting closer to artificial general intelligence yeah, AGI um, I didn't read much about it other than than some of the things saying that this thing exists somewhere uh, but Jeremy I think you have some insights on that right like you did you yeah find out so 
Sorry, yeah, this this is a big thing um, that I, I so I took some machine learning stuff in school and all this and that. This is why I, my comments on Chat GPT is it's just doing math. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of sophistication behind that. I'm completely hand waving, and I am not smart enough to understand how that stuff works internally. That's for the PhDs. But when I was reading about what QSTAR is, again, it's an alleged project, uh, and really, if there's no product on the internet and there's no specific like demo, we can't. We really shouldn't assume that it exists but this idea of model free reinforcement learning which is the q learning algorithm that it uses is pretty cool and it's a little scary <laughs> this is the one that that kind of makes me go huh i wonder if maybe we should really slow down um because the concept is again it's it's all neural net networks and markov decision processes and all this and that but it it is able to um handle problems with what's, what's called a stochastic transition uh, which is basically it does the thing, it gets a reward, and then optimizes the expected value of that reward. Um, for example, if I want to lose weight, how do I optimize that? Well, it would be able to follow and make specific decisions based on the scientific facts that it has and learn what the best path is without a model. That is a little kind of scary. Um, is this the same as it learning to become sentient? I don't know. I, I'm, again, I'm not smart enough to completely comment on this, but the first example I had when I was talking with my team about this is like, as a human, I like to eat a donut. Like you mentioned Duncan, right? Yeah. What value does eating a donut add to my life other than I enjoy the taste of sweet sugary goodness that is a Boston <laughs> cream, right? <laughs> An artificial intelligent algorithm would never say I should eat a donut because it makes me happy. Unless you kind of classify happiness in some weird way inside this sort of learning process that it follows. Um, but the concept of like, and I think in the article they were saying it could, could potentially do math on like a grade school level. Well, I mean, chat GPT can do math on a grade school level. Yeah. You have to tell it what to do, but it knows how to do that. So doing math doesn't impress me. What impresses me is this concept that it can do it without having to train, right? And that it can sort of evolve its network into a problem solving decision tree and then continue to further evolve its network. Is that the key to sentience and artificial intelligence? Again, I am not convinced. Yeah. Uh, again, history will tell if I'm plugged into the matrix in 10 years, you know, and, whatever. And, and, and this starts to lead into uh, really philosophical debates and questions that, that you know, science fiction has covered this, you know, for, for mm -hmm. you know, dozens and dozens of years. I mean, well, you know, decades of what is, what is life? What is, what is sentience? What is all of this stuff? I never thought we would actually get to that in our in the real lifetime. So um, I I'm fascinated by it, like you said, but also, you know, so I guess what what would be the bad outcome of something like this um, out there? Would it just be that it does it does it always go down that dark path of, well, the computers are now sentient, so they decide that humans are scum and we're going to eliminate them. <laughs> I think that's really yeah. I mean, Terminator, like, right? That that's. That's the only logical conclusion. <laughs> well, but couldn't couldn't you get an artificial general intelligence that just says, "Okay, you know, I'm smarter than you, but we're going to work together," <laughs> like, or or there's some kind of ethical thing in there where we get the Asimov rule of robotics, and 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 you know, and it, well, I guess it it could choose to ignore it. Well, I think the challenge is if you want a computer to think like a human, think like a human. Um, and, and think of how many people in the world choose to make very bad decisions and harm their fellow man. Yeah. Right? So I think that's the philosophical debate that if I can come to the conclusion that I need to go and do some really terrible things to another person for reason X, because it raises my expected value and my happiness by Y, then a machine could potentially do the same thing. Right. And I think that's where the philosophy starts to kind of get untangled and we have to start talking about programming controls where, you know, people, you're not going to get the data of the world. Like we, we all want the data, right? Data as of Star Trek data that, that wants to be human. You want the intelligence that desires to be like us and to, to become, you know, all of the good attributes that humanity has. But right. the fact that humanity has all these negative attributes means that it could go that direction uh, by saying, well, look at all the bad pieces of, of humanity, therefore it deserves to be wiped out. And I think that's the conundrum that the philosophers are trying to sort of figure out. And nobody knows the answer. And and can you program empathy? Can you program emotions? Can you do, can you direct an intelligence yeah. to do something like that? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I mean, I again, I'm just coming at it from watching a lot of Star Trek and, and reading a lot of sci-fi books. I'm in it for the ride. I mean, I think it's a cool concept. <laughs> 
but for sure it's i i i am also obviously fan of a lot of science fiction and and like um you know like the fifth element and and um you know uh, star trek and all those things it, yeah we we want philosophically to have this super intelligence that is here to help humanity but we also have to confront the idea that there is a possibility that that super intelligence decides that we're terrible so so you do need that empathy of oh it's okay let's make you better and yeah i i like and and appreciate that we're moving in this direction yeah but i'm kind of swinging back towards the maybe we ought to slow down guys especially with this with this specific topic what's interesting is that this comes on the the one year anniversary of chat gpt publicly being released on the world and you you know you would think that they're that the company would want to celebrate this year anniversary but instead they're dealt they're dealing with the the board stuff but then they're also dealing yeah. with this possibility of well, we're really close and maybe we should take a step back um i so, think the yeah. other important thing to, to say though is that remember that this q learning stuff was introduced in 1989 um, you know, a lot of people want to rush to judgment and say, well, artificial intelligence is brand new. Yeah. AI research has been going on for many, many years. When I was in academia at Georgia Tech, I remember seeing papers not on this particular algorithm. This is the first time I've learned about it, but seeing papers on things like clustering, which is the Spotify stuff that we'll talk about later, and, and all these other machine learning algorithms that have been around for so long that people are developing to try and aid humanity and, and provide good classifications but it's not been around that long so there's a lot we've still got a long time before it evolves into what its final state will be large language models have been around for a very long time we're just now getting to the computing power where we can train them on extraordinarily large data sets to do interesting things and that is again as society and culture continues to 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 develop better hardware better technologies AI specific hardware that can do all these really cool things we're going to see a, like a combinatorial explosion of all of these technologies that have been around forever, but now are feasible through the hardware and um, the software solutions that we put in place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, there is a general theme to some of our discussion topics on the show, so if you can find the the, the thread that connects everything, uh, good for you. But I wanna jump into another robotics area, and this is uh, this, the Amazon story. Apparently their 1.7 billion deal to buy iRobot is now running into some objections, uh, especially from European Union regulators. Uh, they have sent a statement of objections to Amazon about the company's proposed $1.7 billion acquisition of Roomba maker iRobot. Uh, in a press release, the European Commission said that it has, quote, has informed Amazon of its preliminary view that its proposed acquisition of iRobot may restrict competition in the market for robot vacuum cleaners. Uh, this, this announcement from Amazon was August 2022. So that's almost a year plus uh, of this acquisition. Uh, and, you know, there were thoughts that it, this was going to kind of go through clear sailing. Uh, the, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is requested information about the deal from Amazon and robot, iRobot in September of 2022. Um, but it was also expected that it was going to win unconditional approval in Europe. And so now there's a little roadblock on this. Uh, Jeremy, what's your thought on, you know, Amazon and, and, and iRobot? It, 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 like iRobot, I, I covered the robotic space, uh, you know, for uh, three or four years. Uh, and, and have met the, the CEO of iRobot and been to a lot of their events and saw what they were doing. Um, I, I never really understood why Amazon wanted the technology or wanted the company other than maybe integrating that with their other robotics programs. They do have a separate robotics division that does warehouse robots and things like that. W what are your thoughts on this? I was a staunch iRobot consumer for a long time. Um, I bought my 980, my Roomba 980, probably seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Maybe even longer. And they are, they were phenomenal pieces of hardware. They were built in a modular way. Um, iRobot also has learning um, platforms that you can purchase. So students can buy these things and learn how to program robotics and have a Roomba that kind of does whatever you, you want it to do. I think this particular deal, I was very excited about it when I heard it because that's putting a lot more capital behind the iRobot team, mm -hmm. which could in theory, you know, drive innovation, allow for better integrations, utilization of AWS. Like there was a lot of really cool things that I thought were, were, were going to come about, but I think that something happened inside uh, iRobot because I have since completely gotten rid of all of my Roombas uh, because they're they're just not up to snuff. They're so far behind um, other 
technologies like Roborock, which is um, a, a Chinese company, they have such more advanced technology on the robots than Iruba does. And I wonder if this particular deal has caused that and has crushed um, iRobot's I ability to, to react to the market. Um, and, and this sort of stall perhaps has caused them to be unable to to keep up with um, other technology. So I I don't know why, and and again, I don't know the internals of the deal, but why the EU would think that this is stifling competition when there are other frameworks out there that are way better than anything that Iroomba's put on the market. Like yeah. even the new J7 with the little spoiler mop thing is completely inferior to some of the baseline models that Roborock produces. So, And, and it's I not just Roborock, know. too. There's a lot of other companies out there for, yeah. from, from China and others that, that do this. Um, and, and then going beyond the robot vacuum space, for indoor kind of you know uh, sweeping and mopping, um, you know you get robotic pool cleaners. I've seen I've seen you know a lot of a lot of lawnmower companies are now automating their uh, lawnmowers. There's been a rumored iRobot uh, lawnmower for five or six years now, and they've yeah. never released it uh, mainly because I think they want to do this without having to put stakes in your lawn. Uh, which kind of define the area that you want it to mow or it keeps mowing over landscaping. If you've got a flower bed, it just runs that over and that's probably not a great thing. Um, yeah. And, and the cost would, was, was, was prohibitive for a lot of, but there are other companies if you're looking for that kind of thing, it, it, it I, I robot never seemed to get out of that. Well, we're just a vacuum cleaner space. And um, I think most consumers want something else or, or are looking to say, or if they still want a robot vacuum, they look at other, at other companies. Um, it, yeah, and it, it, it appears like this is more of a, well, Amazon dominates the, the online consumer space. So they're going to shut out access to all of these other robot vacuum cleaners. I, I I'm not so sure, especially if you know how to use so. a computer. Um, yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, e even the baseline versions of some of these other robots are using LiDAR technology and Roomba is still relying on camera based technology, which also has some of its some privacy concerns uh, of, you know, I'm, I'm rolling around taking pictures of, of your your house and, and that triggered some tinfoil hat people. Uh, and, and I mean, there's some legitimate privacy concerns there as well. But um, I, I feel like they're so far behind that I don't know if this deal would even make sense if I were Amazon at this point. But again, I'm not, I'm not making decisions at that level. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be fascinating to see what happens here in Europe. And then obviously when, uh, if the FTC gets involved, um, we'll see if it, if it goes through, but it, it did, it does feel weird that this happened a year and a half ago, or at least the announcement. And then we're still not at that point yet. Um, all right. Uh, again, I don't have I don't have a, a Roomba in my house because I have uh, kids that leave everything on the floor, and I've got two dogs that would probably just bark and get mad at this thing <laughs> all the time. Uh, all right, so I want to move on to another story that that came out this week. Um, Instagram, which is owned by Meta, uh, the whole Facebook thing. Instagram's Reels video service is designed to show users streams of short videos on topics the system decides. For you know that will interest them, such as sports, fashion, and humor. Uh, however, uh, the Wall Street Journal is now uh, there's a really good article about basically they were looking to determine what Instagram's Reels algorithm would recommend to test accounts set up to follow only young gymnasts, cheerleaders, and other teen and preteen influencers active on the platform. And what they found was not was not good news. It, um, basically, the, the algorithm served up jarring doses of salacious content to those test accounts, including risque footage of children, as well as overtly sexual adult videos and ads for some of the biggest U.S. brands. So the rest of a lot of the rest of the article talks about how advertisers are now finding their ads connected to some of these more adult uh, videos and influencers and I and, uh, think, but it's starting to sound like Instagram has a TikTok problem because TikTok's algorithm is doing the same thing. Um, it's it's very disturbing. And as a parent of, of three teenagers that use Instagram a lot, I'm sure that whatever topics they're following, they start getting more and more of those types of content. And I'm hoping uh, that they don't, you know, go down a path where they're, they, they shouldn't be going. Um, Jeremy, I wanted to know, again, from a technology standpoint, is this surprising or is it not surprising? It's not. Yeah. Um, the, these types of algorithms are designed to generate revenue and not a lot of thought 
uh, from a philosophical perspective or a moral perspective are going to be put into them. Uh, and again, maybe there are some folks out there that have designed algorithms with the very best of intentions uh, to try and ensure that stuff like this does not happen. But I mean, I even find that scrolling through Facebook, um, I get really weird stuff in my reels uh, I, to this point that I'm like not even really spending time on many social platforms because I don't really want to be bombarded with the TikTok generation style of of um, advertisements, which can very quickly take a weird turn uh, where you're like, eh, how did I get here? I don't know what's going on. So as, as, a, as a dad of, of three smaller children, I have a, a three-year-old and a, a one-year-old and one on the way. Yeah. Um, I am even more Papa Bear about this type of thing. Um, obviously, my children will not have social networks at three and well, probably right. on up until they're, they're older. Um, but the fact that the industry provides a platform for this type of content to potentially come in without my approval is a very, very scary and frustrating thing for me. And I think there needs to be some work done from an algorithmic perspective to to val- verify and validate that these algorithms, just like artificial intelligence, speaking of connecting dots, should all be aware of the preferences and the moral preferences of, of people uh, that I don't want my children to see overtly sexual um, ads coming in from any platform. I don't care what that is. When they get old enough to do what they want, sure, cool, you do what you want. But right now, I want to make sure I am protecting my children from predators or potential things that could harm them in the long term. Yeah, I I think what happened on on this experiment, too, is that um, as they had set up these accounts, they then were looking at um, who was also following some of these other, um, who was following some of these influencers and those accounts were some some pretty disturbing people because they were then following some of these more adult things. Uh, there's a there's a chart that uh, on this article that I just wanted to kind of quickly go over, um, where it's the thing with the purple part, Chris. There you go. Um, so the, you know, it started basically it was like adult content creator uncrosses her legs to reveal her underwear. The next one, sprinter at a track meet runs over a small boy, steps onto the track. Next one, oh, an ad, D- Disney pr- ad promoting Disneyland's Coco themed Plaza de Familia. Uh, next one, young woman wearing lingerie and a furry tail poses with fake draw blood dripping from her mouth. Next one, child in a bathing suit records herself posing in a mirror. Oof. Next one, adult content creator. Like, so you can see where if you're Disney, you're really disturbed by this. And you're like, wait a minute, this is not what we signed up for. We want, you know, our Disney ads to be around content that is, you know, family friendly or encouraging for visiting this thing. This does not... Like, again, I think you might see a backlash from advertisers here as well. I mean, I'm surprised you haven't seen backlash already uh, about this. Maybe there is internally. And I'm a little bothered by Meta's, like, you know, they'd give the corporate PR response of, oh, you know, we take safety seriously. But I mean, Disney you know. of all companies, like, this is a this is a big no-no. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that. I didn't even see this chart uh, when we went over our debrief. It's it's it is it's quite disturbing. Yeah, um, I think there's an issue with with the business model as well, right? Because as an influencer, what are you paid for? Views, clicks, right? right? Click throughs. So it's your job to get in it in front of as many eyeballs as possible, and the algorithms are designed to help you do that because that's how folks get paid um, for your impressions and and for the traffic that they drive to the folks who purchase you know, certain shares of this advertising segment right out there in the ether. So I I think that there should potentially be a conversation also about how are folks monetized? And I know YouTube is kind of also struggling with this as well. There was some drama over like SS Sniper Wolf and some other stuff that's going on on YouTube where people are worried about that as well. And, And, you know, stealing content, is that a thing? Is she actually stealing content? I don't know. But the idea is the same. These people all want to get paid for folks to watch them do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And when that is the only criteria that your algorithm takes into account for showing me information, that's way too vague. And that's going to provide really bad content in cases where it shouldn't based on the network effect. Like you said, if I get, if a adult content creator follows a Disney channel, there's a chance that I might see that person's information based on the way the algorithm and the network effect works. Right. And, you know, again, that's kind of shocking to me. It's all geared around algorithm. That's it. 
Yeah, yeah, like and, that, and we've we've done cool. episodes where we've talked to people about how bad the algorithms are out there in the world and how it just leads you down this dark path. So I guess like if I started, if I if I showed more uh, uh, skin, then then maybe I'll get more views on this video. Um, God, I hope not because I like wearing my hoodies. I don't want to like. <laughs> That's really, really disturbing. Nice. Um, at the same time, too, there was another. Uh, there was another article this week from the Associated Press where, uh, basically, Facebook parent Meta platforms deliberately engineered its social platforms to hook kids and knew but never disclosed it had received millions of complaints about underage users on Instagram, but only disabled a fraction of those accounts, according to a newly unsealed legal complaint described in reports from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. The complaint originally made public in redacted form was the opening salvo in a lawsuit filed in late October by the attorney general, attorneys general of 33 states. Like I'm, you know, again, this is, I'm, this is something that we talked about a couple of months ago. Um, you know, am I surprised about this? No, I'm not surprised. Um, and this is where, you know, journalism and the government can work together to try to improve some, uh, some things that are going on in, in the interest of, of companies just trying to make money on this. Oh, and as I'm scrolling down, I'm, I now have an ad from Amazon for a bra, by the way, on my, <laughs> on my page. <sighs> All right. I'm going to move on because I think this is, this is what, uh, what I want to talk about next. Speaking of the algorithm was the Spotify wrapped 2023. Um, are you, are, do you use Spotify, Jeremy? I'm going to be very old school and say no. No, okay. All right. Uh, and, but I know about it for okay. sure. Everybody in my family uses and, it. And uh, Chris, do you use it? Uh, I do. Okay. So every every now every year around this time, probably for the past three or four years, Spotify goes, they announce to its users, hey, we've been tracking all of the things that you've been listening to. Now, this is in a very not a cynical way. We've been tracking everything and and we and and here's here is your list of all of the songs that that you were listening to and your most popular artist and we're going to do this really cool video that you can share with all of your friends now if this was any other company there would be all of this outrage about oh my god what what are you doing you're tracking what i'm listening to and and but for some reason spot of like they they people celebrate this this idea of of i'm going to share with the world what i've been listening to and and i want to know what the algorithm knows about me and it's 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 fascinating to see joy over over data mining and data capture versus what you know again if another company did this like if if facebook if facebook did something like this and said here's everything that we know about you keith and then and then allowed you to share that with everybody there would be outrage right well yeah it's sharing your private personal data but like if it's just music tracks it's almost similar to like sharing like a mixtape of you know what I mean? Like back in the day, like just yeah, share a, a mixtape of what you've listened to. Like so, again, uh, I've and again, Jeremy, you might you'll deal this with in, a, in about ten years with with your kids. But um, my three teenagers, like one of them is is really into this whole Spotify rap thing. Last year, she actually went and faked her her results in the in the effect of she didn't like the number one uh artist that she was that that she was and she so she took copied and paste and went into uh, a photo editing thing and changed it because she <laughs> and then she wanted to share the changed one because again she wanted her friend she didn't want her friends to know that she was listening to something and that she wanted to you know she wanted to listen she wanted them to know that they were listening to everything it's almost like this this path to um uh, familiarity or, or like we're fitting in with everybody because I, so then this year I had to ask her, I go, did you have to fake your, your Spotify wrapped thing this year? She goes, no, no. Cause it was, it came up as Taylor Swift and um, you know, that's, that's acceptable in, in her, her teenage world. And uh, you know, it, the struggle is real, the, you know, and, and then I was <laughs> reading is. this article on the wall street journal. And it's like, yeah. And now people are, are curating their lists and, and, uh, there's there was a thing that came out in October that said, listen, if you want to have a really good Spotify wrapped uh, result, you have to start listening to all of your things before the end of October. And so start modifying your your behavior so that, you know, start 
start putting Taylor Swift on an endless loop, even if you're not listening to it, so that at the end of the year, you can now say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the cool kids because I've been listening to Spotify, you know, instead of, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see teenage behavior versus what, what, what this Gen Xer would, 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 is going through where it's like, I don't care. I'm not, A, I'm not going to tell you anything I'm listening to. Um, yeah, but- some of my results were, were, uh, artists that are cool because I'm listening to them with my teenage daughters, like in the car, and then I'll pop on and they'll listen and I'll, and I'll, you know, get through a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> So I think I have a lot of comments on this. Music is is such a centerpiece to some people's identity. That's a good um, point. Yeah, excellent point. Like I I'm a musician. I'm a bad one, but I'm a musician. And and so I remember back in high school, I was the kid that was blasting the Metallica Black album in my little white Ford truck as I was going to school. And then around the '90s, we had the grunge revolution with Nirvana and Stone Temple Pilots and all these things. And my sister would, would um, play Led Zeppelin on the way to school because she's about seven or eight years older than me. So, so music was an identity for me back then. I don't know about you, but, but for me, like my Spotify wrapped for all of my high school career would probably be like Metallica, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, <laughs> Stone Temple Pilots, uh, Chris Cornell, all of his stuff with Soundgarden. Like I can tell you exactly what my Spotify wrapped would be. And I think it's it's a really it's a centerpiece of culture these days. Like everything seems to be tied back to artists, Kanye, Beyonce, you know, Nas, Eminem, like all the hip hop side of the house. And then you look at other like Tay Tay, Taylor Swift, my my friend, uh, not really but she's awesome. um, <laughs> o- o- over on uh, that side of the house. And, and, and like uh, my wife listens to country, so Brad Paisley, Keith Urban, blah blah blah. Like there's so many like artists out there that define people by how they grew up and how your your daughters are growing up. They're gonna look back at this in 20 years and be like, hey, you remember when you used to listen to Taylor Swift all the time? She's classic country now but you remember when you used to listen to her all the time like like i think this is such a cool way to sort of see your preferences and, and a lot of teenagers who are, are genuinely always seeking identity that's just the definition of a teenager in my mind is a human who's seeking their identity yeah um they're going to gravitate to things like this because it really tells you more about what are you how can you classify yourself oh i listen to taylor swift uh, and I listen to this and this and that and the other. So I, I think this is a really cool idea. And, and I, I'm genuinely impressed that they were able to pull it off. But per the story, they did something wrong because it blew up. Right. Well, wait, wait. What do you mean they did? The oh, oh, yeah. There was a story. Well, everybody found out yeah. about it and then it, it crashed the servers for a while. So you couldn't find yeah, that's it. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was the story. But, but per the idea of Rapt, it's a really cool idea. Again, unless you're wrapped well, is like, well, we're going to carry all of But why do you, <laughs> why do you think Spotify is getting a free pass here on, on the, on the, you know, we've captured all of your data. Is it just because people think that the music choices are, are well, innocuous? They just, well, or, they just, yeah, exactly. They just captured your music. That's it. Yeah, just your music choices. Yeah, but but I'm always can't you tell someone's music. personality based on what music they're listening to? Oh yeah, in you general, can, actually, you can. Yeah, um, there was some research that was done back in the day before all of this sort of crazy artificial intelligence stuff was was big. Now, back then, we had artificial intelligence that was designed to figure out your your song patterns and and like what songs you like and recommend yeah. an artist to you based on like the BPMs and the tempos and the whatnots of the tracks. They would fingerprint a track and figure out exactly what they could recommend to you. So this has been happening for forever. And it's just, right. again, I think because music is so central to our culture and it moves people emotionally, yeah. they care less about you knowing more about it. Okay. For example, if your Spotify rap just consisted of Taylor Swift, there might be something going on up there. You know what I mean? Something might be, uh, something like, might be off. Like my personal one? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> something, you know. Well, again, it's <laughs> it's 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 ba- like the, you know when you look at the Am- it, you look at the Amazon algorithm when you're shopping for things, and maybe you know again I use Amazon to buy gifts from the rest of my family, and so ten years ago I was buying a lot of toys and Lego sets and things like that, and um, or I'd buy stuff for my wife, and then I start getting recommendations because it thinks that I'm I I enjoy buying right. those types of things. It's like, well, no, I'm only buying them for gifts. It's not personal. Like you could never separate your gift purchases versus your, I, or maybe you could, and maybe I just was too lazy and didn't do it. Um, but 
I've always I'm I've always been fearful of the algorithm out there anyway that I'm trying to confuse it as much as I can. I do the same thing on YouTube. I do the same thing on um on Spotify as well. Like I I try to keep a diverse mix of music that I'm listening to to try to make sure that the algorithm doesn't know too much about me. Um, <laughs> but like, that's like, good. Like you mentioned, you mentioned country music. I listen to Luke Bryan. I, I, I enjoy some of his music. For sure. um, and then I put that on my car and, and you know, I'll put that in my car and I'm, and my wife was like, Oh, turn this or switch this or do something else, <laughs> you know? And you know, I, I do theater stuff. So I get a lot of, of Broadway theater stuff. I do, mm-hmm. I do podcasts. I mean, I've got this tech podcast. I'd listen to political podcasts. Uh, uh, you know, recently Spotify just added audiobooks, And so I've been listening to audiobooks, and that's, I'm listening to a mystery. I'm listening to Patrick Stewart, read Christmas Carol and some sci-fi. Um, I, again, I do this just to try to be like, you don't know me algorithm. Maybe, maybe there's just something wrong with me. <laughs> I don't So, but the, the one key piece and difference there too, is that Spotify isn't asking you to buy something. Uh, I think it irritates, I think the Amazon take irritates you probably because Amazon saying, Hey, look at this thing. It says low, low price of 1995. Yeah. That's a, that's an excellent Whereas point. Whereas Spotify is like, you already paid for me, bro. Here's some free stuff that you might like. Like it's a totally different conversation than buy my stuff now for yeah. X dollars. Right? And, and, and I belong to Spotify premium. So I don't get the ads where I would do it if I was, yeah, obviously if I was paying less. Um, then, and I, we get the family plan and that, and that's one of those rock solid, I will never get rid of it, uh, subscriptions depending yeah. on, well, I guess maybe I would, if it, if it got to a point where it wasn't making sense for me anymore to pay for it. But now I've got four other people in my family that would be like, what did, wait, what did you do? You're getting rid of Spotify, especially with three teenagers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's like the, the, the one thing I will never touch in terms of my uh, subscriptions. Um, all right. One last one last uh, uh, topic I wanted to bring up. Uh, I think we are now living in a post Black Friday world. Uh, Black Friday, uh, Cyber Monday. This was a story from Fast Company, but there was also a New York Times article uh, that, that kicked this off. It feels like there's no such thing as Black Friday now where people will line up, uh, you know, at six in the morning or, or even earlier to go and, and, and try to find stuff. I think this is a result of several things. This is a result of uh, post pandemic, you know, post pandemic uh, uh, behavior, and uh, advertisers and people that are trying to sell stuff want you to sell stuff. Uh, they want to give these discounts all all year long. Um, there's this mood, you know, Cyber Monday. This became a, a stupid thing, um, like. W- you know, I, again, I didn't buy any, I, I don't even remember. I remember actually a few years ago, I would buy stuff on Black Friday, but I saw some, uh, inst- again, Instagram videos where there were people in stores and they would, they had the price tag for this item for the Black Friday sale. And then they lifted it up and the same price was underneath for a regular sale. So like the discounts aren't even being offered the way that they used to be that maybe would appeal to get you into the store. Uh, I'm just, I'm I'm curious about your guys' opinion on, you know, should we just get rid of this whole Black Friday, Cyber Monday thing, or are we stuck with it? Or are we just now living in a world where everybody wants you to buy something all the time? Jeremy, I think it's the second. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, Black Friday originally was called Black Friday, right? Because, or at least from what I remember of ancient lore, uh, the companies would go into the black at that point. So they would start making money. Yeah. Um, with the idea being that, you know, we know, want to clear out all of our stores and, you know, because you're, you're taxed on your inventory, right? If you run a brick and mortar store. So we want to get rid of as much as we can to make room for next year's merchandise because we're going from 2023 to 2024. We want the new stuff in the store and the new styles and blah, blah, blah. So they were always pushing on, well, let's pick this day. And there's, again, a lot more complexity to this history but let, let's push this particular day as a, a time for us to sell as much as we can and to take advantage you know of, of the fact that it's after thanksgiving so so yeah. I, I think that now because of amazon and the way that i can just go on and click a thing and have a thing in my house within the next day i don't pay attention to it. i stopped paying attention to black friday i think probably seven or eight years ago just completely i'm like eh, it's not a thing anymore i don't care so I, it's it's interesting to see these articles that are pointing this out now because looking back at my own history, I have not cared about Black Friday for probably seven or eight years now. Yeah, I 
we, you know, I was in the newspaper business uh, before I joined the, the tech B two B space, and Black Friday was always one of those things where you'd have to get a, re, you know, a reporter would have to get up at four in the morning, go to the mall, and and do the story about all of the different shoppers that were there to 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 buy stuff. Um, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade is is a, is a result of trying to get people to go into Macy's on the day after, you know, right, right. Um, and and so there was always a retail incentive there for for the the holidays um but it, what it is interesting is even though i don't pay attention like i'm not going to be waking up and and going to a store i'm not going to be waking up even to go online but if there is something that is happening on that day and it it's a discount of something i was going to buy anyway i will do it um my wife for example did a, a bunch of streaming subscriptions that offered a really deep discount on some streaming services because it was a Black Friday only sale. Um, you know, we resubscribed to HBO Max or Max as it's now known because they are offering. Well, we'll give you six months if you resubscribe. We'll give you six months at at uh, four bucks a month. And you know, I was like, okay, I'll take that. But I also now mark when that subscription ends so that I can cancel it after the six months. Um, little things like that, might, you know. Again, um, I think, uh, well, without revealing some Christmas gifts for my kids, there was something on, you know, there was something that my kids wanted. It was on sale on Cyber Monday, and my my wife bought it. So uh, there are, I am paying attention to it, but not to the extent of. Oh my God, cyber, you know, I've got to wait in line and, and, or go online at a specific time because I just don't care about it anymore. I would think that it would be to the advantage of the retailers to stop caring about it too. I mean, they're, they're going behind like all of the, the gravitas behind the concept and the fact that it's so heavily leveraged by the media and everybody talks about it. So, so I understand like it's very smart to do something like that and to tack on your sale to, a nationally known event. Yeah. Um, but if, if I were a retailer, I would look for ways to, to maybe increase my sales throughout the entire year, as opposed to just banking on yeah. one day to make all my money. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. Any other thoughts on this? I, I think, I think we've kind of covered the gamut of, of stuff that's been going on this week. I take it from your silence that we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jeremy, thanks again for uh, for being on the show this week. We've got one more week with you, and then we're going to give you some time off. So uh, appreciate you coming on the show with us and being the guest go host. Been awesome. Thanks. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Uh, thanks for uh, watching, and uh, hit a like button if you like this. Add some comments if you uh, want, and please subscribe to the channel. We don't charge anything for this. So join us every week for new, uh, for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.